Yeah. We cross over just to. Are we going to the well, we can... well, across? Well, yeah. Can we just. No, I don't know. They can do it. Do you want to just quickly look at this one? Yeah. Um, the, little, the drawings that he did building up to this show that place. And uh, that's what they sometimes. This was when the church was getting very flat. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
to say um, Sutton itself, I love the history of the village because when you look at the old spelling of it, it was called Sutton, it was S-U-D-T-O-N-E and it meant the South Farm or the South Settlement and um, I always wondered what it was south of, because it's not south of Hull, it's sort of northeast <laughs> of Hull and it meant it was south of Warne and Warne was the mother church over that way and then beyond to, to Muse Abbey and all that area around there so the focal point was sort of to the north of them, north of Sutton um, and it's in Holderness, which again I love, I love finding origins of these words. Holderness meant a neck of land owned by an elder yeoman. So mm. the el elder yeoman is Holder and a nest is a, a neck, of, neck of land. And uh, it's very advantageous in Sutton because it's on one of the highest bits of Hull that you can, you can be on. It's actually on a ridge. A friend of mine is a geologist and he reckons it's probably from a terminal moraine they call it, where the ice glaciers were retreating and then they halted and raised the level of the, the land. And somebody told me this, if somebody tells me I believe it, that yeah. the bottom of the church, St James here, is on the same level as the top of Hull Minster, Holy Trinity. So that's how high up this land is. So in future years, with climate change and everything, Sutton will be the best place to relocate. Yeah, yeah. To <laughs> but to avoid all the flooding that's about to occur around the, around the world. So, um, so it was very, um, in the Doomsday Survey, it's listed, there was 18 families listed here. And it was mainly agricultural, all the, the land around here that got drained. Um, a lot of the drainage was done by the monks of Muse Abbey. They dug out the ditches and the drains or the dikes. Um, there's still a, a name in Brands Home which is Four Dyke, and it meant the main dike that they, they established. And as well as being um, drainage ditches, there were modes of transport, there were medieval canals. So they could bring the stone and the building materials and the produce from the River Hull into this area. I don't think they get enough credit, the monks of Mule Savvy, but you all think the canals were each sort of industrial revolution and in fact there were medieval canals with these, because it's the only way of travelling around this, this area really was through the, through the water. So it established itself with the reckon now, I think the last I saw the census about 3,000 people live in the area around this. It started off with 18 and uh, has risen to 3,000 and it is in the city. It, the boundary of the city got extended in 1929 to incorporate Sutton. So it is actually the village within the city um, and it's a conservation area, quite rightly, quite rightly so as well. And a little quiz, if you want to win 50 quid off anybody, ask them how many, how many medieval churches there are in Hull. And most people will say two, they'll say St Mary's in Lowgate and um, Hull Minster. But in fact, the Sutton here is also St James's, which is in the city, city boundary. So if you want to win 50 quid, that's a question you can do a local history question there. And what I like about the village, it's, it is conservation area and it's the contrast in architecture. There's some really slightly, really ancient. So it's nice to see, I always remember it being really run down and dilapidated. So it's been really good to see it restored. I remember Chris Ketchell, he always liked to put things into context. It was slightly wrong because it, it might be later than he thought at the time. But he said at the, the time King Charles I was not being allowed into Hull. Property. <laughs> yeah, and he just put, he put history into context, doesn't it? About, you know, like, I'm a big fan of our blue plaques around the city, I do like them. And um, that's very interesting, this. I'll read it out. It says, during the Spanish Civil War, 36 to 39, this building, 30 Church, Church Street, was home to 40 refugee children mm. um, from the Basque region of northern Spain who were cared for by local volunteers. Mm. So there was, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, there was an evacuation of um, youngsters. There was 40 here. Um, the house then belonged to a very famous Sutton family, which were the Sewells. So um, they were housed here. And then in Pearson Park as well, there's one of the big houses around the park. And another group of refugee children were housed there. And um, they, they did form an association, Bath Children of 37 Association. And that part of the building to the town.
Probably the only British river with a city named after it. Um, only 25 miles long and yet it has 40 tributaries. It has 17 bridges but only five of them are not in Hull or Driffield. And it is England's most northerly chalk stream. It's a chalk fed relatively low sediment levels suspended in it and therefore high clarity of water. Tributaries that I mentioned, um, some of them have lovely names. Um, we have the Black Kell, the Blue Kell, the Driffield Trout Stream, Gosbedale Dyke, Norks Dyke, Meadow Stream, Rattling Water, Scurf Dyke, Spittlebeck and Water Forlorn. The valley itself, as I said, has wetland areas which are inundated by water either permanently or seasonally. Wetland areas are biologically diverse and can be used for purifying water and preventing floods. There are also areas of marsh, bog and car. The valley was created where the springs flow from the eastern slope of the walls onto silts and clay. To the north we have areas of car land. Now cars are areas of scrub and low growing plants that are never totally dry. Further south, salt marsh and in some areas bog and peat are present under the modern soil levels. There were 29 medieval moat sites and six were thought to be monastic granges, so farms outside the monastery itself. A possible fishery at Fishholm Barn near the confluence of the River Hall and Froddingham Beck. Now we are coming alongside the um, canal here at Wandsford. There are up to seven granges belonging to Muse Abbey have been identified on aerial photographs. That was found at Putnam Cranswick, or just near it, Putnam Cranswick anyway. I don't know why it's there. There's no context here. The context is everything in archaeology. You, you relate things to where they're found and it tells a story. This is a, is a mystery because when I was talking about boulder clay and chalk and everything, this area has been swept over by glaciers and things like that. And strictly speaking, anything as old as this, well, it starts a life somewhere way to the west or north. The replica, replica of the Kirtland warrior, whose grave was found in 1987 on the big dig that had been progressing down the valley from uh, Kirtland towards, uh, sorry, from Garton towards Kirtland. And the, this is our recreation of the grave. Kirtland warriors. This is from about 200 BC. He was a man of about 25. He died, so far as we can tell, of natural causes, disease or something or other, but he was not killed in battle because his bones showed no sign of trauma or defensive wounds like you would get from uh, a battle situation. He was buried with food. Now, we thought originally we would say that he was buried with food for the afterlife, but actually it's, it seems it's more the practice that when they died, there's a big bean feast around them. So well, I've been doing this for about six hours a day or something like that. And when they find stones in a row or stones with a hole in, it's indicative of the presence of a loom.
Another key thing about it is it is a complete scheme of, uh, of de decoration with, I think down here we've got the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, and the creation of the world, and Adam and Eve. Uh, up here we've got, I think, saints and apostles in the, as appropriate in the East End, Saint, saints and uh, New Testament. Yes, New yeah, Testament. all the apostles there on the south side. Yep. Everything you can see is decorated, um, mm. um, apart from us as visitors. Um, we've got, the, the ceiling is, is decorated intricately, the tiling along on the floor and um, font cover, I would imagine the light, the lights probably. And the elaborate Reredos mar marble, Reredos? Yes, yep. by Redfern, I think. Um, anything, anything else, Stephen, that you can... Well, what I was going to say was this church is really very much one of a pair and the other one is Kirkland. Um This is slightly smaller, but each of them has uh, basically a Norman structure, although there's more left of what the Normans built at Kirkman than there is here. A lot of the, a lot of the structure here actually is 19th century. Yes. This is all a tidied up farmyard, isn't it? I think so. Oh, yeah, there's a sort of summer, I think summer house Ah. Uh -huh. Just look at them. Do you know I haven't seen many of those before? And it was Francis Johnson's favourite church, and it's, it's much inspired by his visits to Denmark when he was There is no chancel, merely a spacious sanctuary, and St Margaret of Scotland depicted in the east window is also referred to in the wrought iron altar rail with the marguerites and in the pall over the altar which was worked to my design by the ladies of the village. I regard St Margaret's as one of my two best churches and certainly the best love I need. So uh, I, I, I was very puzzled then to try and work out which the other one was. But uh, I think it was probably the, the Roman Catholic Church in Scarborough. So, uh, 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 some other details here, I don't know, but I think perhaps they disappeared. Uh, when the uh, photographs were taken from the book, the levers were all in place, a continuous lever. There were some people on the ground, I think that the silver Yes, yes. But the, the embroidery on those was designed by Francis and worked locally, wasn't it? Uh, again, incorporating marguerites and um, doves. And um, the, this font here, I think, is a rather pleasing design. It's a sort of simplified Georgian design, but with quite a lot of vitality and the, the dove resting on the top. Now, the stained glass is by Leonard Everts, who was the Master of Art at King's College, Newcastle upon Tyne. And in fact, he was there when I was a student at Newcastle University in the School of Art. Because he was trying to reflect the fact that the sea is just over there and getting closer every day. <laughs>
estate belonged to Lord Hovell. Um, Pearson, you may know, did the great estate church at South Dalton. Uh, and so that's obviously the link why Pearson was involved here at Humbleton. Uh, I'm not quite sure why he was working for Stan Sykes at Hillston, but presumably there was some kind of a connection there. I don't think Pearson worked for the Sykes. Uh, I did find, funnily enough, the sort of thing that you find at the bottom of the church uh, safe. A, uh, a step checkbook stub uh, on drawn on Pease's bank, uh, paying Mr. Pearson whatever it was, fifty guineas or something. For his architectural services. <laughs> so uh, uh, yes. So uh, at that stage, uh, the, at least part of the aisles were unroofed. Uh, it obviously was in quite a state. Uh, I was saying to one of the, the, the company uh, when we were at um, one of the earlier churches, you know, we, we tend to be a bit critical of the Victorians and their restorations. But I think they were very often dealing with churches that were in a pretty desperate state. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs>